I'm excited about this one. I'm rushing because I've just been finishing watching his two specials. The Times say he's the world's greatest living comedian. Let's just do it. Stuart Lee. Stuart. There you are. Hello. Hey, how are you? All right. So now. Rob, have you seen any of these things that I'm doing? Oh, I've seen both of them. Oh, you've seen both? Okay, great. Fine. That's all right then. Great. And uh, you're going to just die under a blanket of praise and <laughs> so be be ready with your self-effacing responses i've literally just finished watching tornado i watched snowflake about two days ago uh and they are superb oh well i'm so pleased to hear that from you because we're all great as morals of your work in our house look there's there's so much there's so much to talk about so these these are two uh, one hour special yeah. snowflake and tornado oh they're so good i mean they are they are dense they are dense there is so much in there it, it felt like reading a book in as much as you want in as to, much as it was boring <laughs> no in as much as you want to enjoy the light oh it's just, it's beautiful stuff Stuart. let's start with you mentioned in the in the second one when you got onto the Dave Chappelle stuff that you run these shows in at the Leicester Square Theatre with a hell of a lot of preparation. Yeah. Tell people how you construct these shows. I remember talking to you about that there, actually. You said to me, I do about three days and I've got it. <laughs> and, um, and then you were off. Oh, God, I remember I'm, thinking, I'm hung, hung no, by my no, own no, rope. Because it's a different thing, right? Mine are sort of finished and then they become another thing in the process of sort of falling apart in front of an audience. So ideally I get to the point where I know it so well after a couple of months at Leicester Square Theatre that I can smash it to bits and then rebuild it if I need to. And, you know, I, I, I can find find all different ways out of it. And I, I kind of know what stresses and strains you can put on it. It's a different thing. When they come to you, they, they, have, they don't want that. <laughs> they don't want to feel tense and embarrassed and nervous and for it to go wrong. They just want a night out. But the people, they want to have a bit of fun. What about where we are now? Does a joke have to have a victim? Punching down, punching up, discuss. Well, I don't think it has to have uh, a victim. Isn't there always one, though, even no. if it is oneself? I suppose how this discussion of punching up and punching down has happened, it was actually Chris Rock that coined that phrase, I think, punching up and punching down. Was it? Yeah, although, again, when you look at those guys 20, 30 years ago, well, they'll be really, like woke as we'd call it now in some areas they're often got stuff about women or gay people that you go oh you wouldn't say that now it's become an issue as people have thought about it more at the moment i don't necessarily think that's a bad thing and that's partly what both of those shows are about particularly a uh, snowflake i thought i'd dive into it head on and um and see what happened i tend to think because i came out of the 80s alternative comedy scene the idea was that you pushed upwards against power and obviously that's what yeah. satirists would say but there's something funny about unnecessary cruelty as well you know isn't it? i mean there's a simon munnery line when he used to do his fascist dictator character the league against tedium you know one day i was torturing a, a kitten or something and a woman came by and said don't you know all god's creatures are capable of suffering and i said yes and hence of providing me with amusement <laughs> so it's sort of like there yeah, is something yeah, yeah, that is in the essence yeah. that we like to see things squirm as well um so it's difficult to make a, a definite ideological case for it i just think at the moment there's a lot of just real shit stuff being said about people that are fairly vulnerable in stadiums by billionaires you said earlier uh the stuart lee character i this i mean a lot of people are interested in this element of you a lot of my fellow comedians noel fielding yeah. Greg Davis, John Cleese, uh, Tim Vine. I mean, uh, different people. They, they get, um, Ricky Gervais, they get mentioned, sometimes less than flatteringly. To what extent is that your feeling about them? Okay, well, or is it is it a character feeling? I absolutely feeling uh, love Noel Fielding. I think he's brilliant. And I don't think, Good. I think in the show, the thing I'm saying about him 
it's me. The character of me thinks what is saying what he does is rubbish, and then tries to do it and can't. So it has to just dismiss it out <laughs> yeah, of hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Tim yeah. Vine is yeah. brilliant, and I, yeah. and I went to see Tim Vine, and I, I, and I. Well, I think what I say in the show is I'm like Tim Vine on amphetamines or something. I, yes. it's not a criticism yeah. of Tim Vine. No, Obviously, no. John Cleese. You know, without John Cleese, none of us have a career. You know, he's part of a generation that changed everything, and you'll never be able to take Forty Towers or um, or Monty Python away. Uh, but I do think that he's becoming increasingly one of these reactionary old men complaining about young people. And that's what I'm talking about in the show. I think The Office is brilliant. I think Ricky's uh, comedy drama work is of diminishing returns to the point where it's now abysmal. I think it must be very sad if you're teaching drama or creative writing. How can you make a case for the things that make drama and creative writing good when Afterlife is a success? You know, because your kids could just go, but none of those things happen in this. And yet millions of people watch it. I think it's one of the worst things that's ever been made by a human. <laughs> <laughs> but I read that you were a big influence. I know, yeah, well, it's awful. And it's he like has, being... a, he's a, he's a, uh, uh, he's said, said yeah, as much. Well, I don't suppose Robert Oppenheimer felt great about having created the atomic bomb, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <He sort> of... <laughs> and that's the most obvious comparison. I want to quote you some of these things that I wrote down because I've never scribbled as furiously. And I want to say again. It's not an exam, it's, Rob. It's not like uh, but seriously, Stuart, it's so good. So good. And when you quote, you quote a critic, Ben Thompson, who says in, your, in this, the this actually happened bit, which is beautifully done. He says it's the apogee of all you've achieved in the last 30 years. Now, here's a line. It's lean, it's cut to the bone. You say, it isn't, of course, that's why it's funny. But, of course, it is. It is lean. It is as lean and as it's possible to be, and that's the delight. But will there be a percentage of your audience who accept what you say that it isn't and think that you are rambling? To what extent? Yeah, there's a question I came up with, and you mentioned, you touched on this earlier, you said something. When I go out in front of a crowd, I always think... Or oh, there's a fair number here who don't want to be here. They're here because their girlfriend or wife or, or mother is often the case, yeah. likes me, yeah. right? Um, but I sense with you, oh, they're all pretty bloody on message and, and they want to be no, there. No, often I, 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 can really, I can tell often there's a, a partner, normally a woman to be fair, who's yes. been brought by oh, the husband oh. or the boyfriend. And in fact, and they... A resistant to me, and in fact, I'm working this up into a bit in the new show. A bit, that's another one of our things, isn't it? About um, men patronizingly explaining to women why they think I'm a good comedian, and the women having to, and they go, Have you not heard of Stuart Lee? Oh, he's really good, actually, I'd really like him. Uh, and uh, then the women have to kind of live with this bloke, and also a lot of the blokes that like me, they like me anyway. So, why do the women, the women don't want to go and see more of the things that are irritating about their partner anyway? But then what happens every night? Yeah. Uh, Every yeah, night in the yeah. queue, when I'm selling stuff afterwards, there'll be three or four women that come up to me and go, I didn't want to come because he lies in bed with a laptop laughing at you. And I go, you're not watching that boring bl bloke again, are you? And I didn't expect to like it, but it's been really great and I can't wait to come again. You know, they have to, they basically are irritated by the the interest that their partner has. And then when they finally do go, they like it. But yeah, there's all, I can see who's been brought. And I like to talk to those people directly and often funny stories come out about it you need some people in the room to, that you've got to win over well for example uh in the bit where you said uh, where is it hey, uh, this actually happened that's cool you the way you yeah. go round and round and as a comedian i'm watching and going is he going to do it again well thank you very much indeed because I, I it took me a long time to get that right and uh, i can imagine and yeah and that's what i was thinking I yes 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 just would die you know and I had to go. A lot of audiences had to suffer for you to be able to enjoy that. <laughs> but you would go through that dying. You see, I that's where we're different. You said when we met, I think the only time we met was backstage yeah. at the um, the Leicester Square. Yeah, yeah. And you said something nice. And I was all ready for me to be one of these people that you weren't that keen on. Oh. And you said you said I had some transferable skills. What was the word you used? <laughs> that's what I said. I, 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 I've always remembered it. Well, what I meant, I think I said you didn't have to do it hundreds of times because you had yeah. transferable skills. What I meant was you, got like, actual, yeah, what, you could make a man sound like he was in a box or you could do, I can't, <laughs> I, can't do any, I can't do anything. That's why every show I try to do something that's difficult for me. 
you know, and that in in uh, yeah. Snowflake, it was this sort of free jazz vocalese retching that's really beyond my skill set. Yes, you describe your York audience as famously taciturn. Do you? I wrote. Do your audience vary, or are they the liberal elite of wherever you are? They do vary. They they vary less than they used to. Uh, Thirty years ago, I think that's because regional differences yeah. are eroding yeah. a little bit. I also and everyone has, uh, and also more of the people that come yeah. know I am. Where, where they, I think it's still true that in Glasgow, Liverpool, and Belfast, you normally have to pull something out of the bag in the first twenty minutes to show them that you're not going to be bossed around. Uh-huh. I think there's also a thing where, you know, you go to places that are economically depressed, where not necessarily a lot of stuff passes through, like Peterborough, and there's an excitement about you going there, which is different to yeah. cities where they take yeah. you for granted. And that's really, you start yes. to then feel a bit messianic, like it's your duty to go to <laughs> Kettering, and, you know, and, and, uh, and Corby yeah. and sort of, because the people that want to see stuff there, they're there. They're not really catered for. I think those audiences are more excitable. The Guardian readers of that town, I think. But it's mixed up. I mean, if you go to Aberdeen, you know, you get all sorts because not not a lot of people go there. So yeah. like everyone yeah. comes out. I do like those kind of crowds where you have to fight it. You played uh, the Eden Court at Inverness. Yeah, not, I didn't on the last tour, but I normally do, yeah. I've played there. That's my strangest ever heckle. And it was it was a non-verbal heckle. It was a woman I noticed sitting on her own in the audience, reading a book during my show, and I and I she just sat there reading, and I I couldn't ignore it. So I spoke to her, and to to uh, to make matters worse, the book was the history of genocide. <laughs> you know what I. I didn't get a heckle in um, Eden Court, but I got a, a, a letter afterwards from Eden Court where someone had just complained that why was I doing stand up if I didn't like doing it, and why was I um, why didn't I you know make jokes work properly, and it wasn't really fair to go. And I oh. thought, and then the next two I didn't go to Eden, Eden Project Eden Court in Inverness, and it wasn't for that reason. But I sort of thought, well, it really stuck with me that I, I couldn't they also <laughs> that show had quite an elaborate set which had a joke that tied into the. I think it was a load of. It was the yeah. It was um, one of climb up the mountain of DVDs and look like um, look like a German expressionist yeah, painting. Yeah, so the yeah, idea yeah. that you hadn't thought about what you're doing, but you'd accidentally kind of got all these things there. <laughs> I mean, you know. So I was annoyed. But then, of course, so I sort of took against that gig for that reason. All the way through these two specials, your uh, publicist or whoever it is that's arranging it said to said to my people, "Can he watch? It'd be great if he could watch both of them." Okay. Well, I wanted to watch both of them. It was a privilege to see them before they went out. So I, I'd watched the first one and then I had to go and do a thing. So as I think I said to you when we started, I finished the second ones before. And all the way through, I was thinking, have they asked me to watch these because at some point he I'm mentions sure. me in a less than flattering way? So my excitement was slightly tinged with, oh, Christ, is he about to really destroy well, I'm sure, me? Well, I'm sure I have done at some point. I mean, I'm sure there's been a bit where I've... It would be inevitable that I've done something about not being able to do impressions or it's just, you know, it's right. inevitable. But those things are not, I don't know why people make such a fuss about it because most of them, obviously the Ricky Gervais thing is slightly different, but most of them, <laughs> they actually show an awareness of the person's work. That means I have obviously watched it enough yeah. to, to like yeah, it yeah, and yeah, understand yeah. it. Well, it all depends on what, it would de- depend on what you said because you you could say something that might that might touch a nerve because any criticism is fine. Uh, yeah, any criticism yeah. we get online is fine unless there's yeah. a little bit of you that kind of agrees with it. In which case, yeah. then, ouch! Look, I have to wrap this up because 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 I could carry on forever. I wanted to say to you, rolling around in a tsunami of his own urine. I wanted to say, trapped in the rear light of a Ford Fiesta, um, night voices <laughs> under lockdown. Going well by British oh, yeah. standards. Why are you late? Yeah. This it won't ruin it because you'd have to watch. They'd have to watch it. No, yeah. Local knowledge like the Taliban. I was just. I was hooting out loud. It's. It's. These well, are such much. pieces of work, Stuart. You should be so proud of them. Well, it's very kind of you. I'm very glad that you watched them. And will you say hello to your brother who I uh, met in a pub garden in uh, Hay on Yes, you. About five yes, years. Yes, you ago. did. He said. 
I think you're friends with my brother. <laughs> I went, well, I've met him once, I think. And he, but that, we st- he's still got an air out of that. You know, he was a nice bloke. That yeah. just tells you I probably <laughs> say that I'm friends with you. <laughs> well, my dad told his family that he managed to get in the Philippines that I had written Blackadder and then was slightly worried that I would visit him and that the kudos he had got of being the father of the writer of Blackadder would evaporate. I did also point out to him that I was at school when Blackadder was on, so I don't know what he was thinking. Yeah, well, you were were a child prodigy. You were very good. Somewhere in the Philippines, there's a lot of people that think I wrote Blackadder. There are worse things. Stuart, it's been so lovely to spend some time with you, uh, full of admiration. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot, Rob. See you then. Cheers. Cheers.